This morning's scripture comes from the second letter of Paul to Timothy. It is believed that Paul wrote this letter to Timothy from prison. Timothy was a colleague of Paul's, but he was also someone that Paul had mentored in the faith, and he had a very special relationship with this young man. So listen now to the opening words of this letter. I am grateful to God, whom I worship with a clear conscience, as my ancestors did, when I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Over my years in ministry, through all the study and prayer and living in this community of faith, there are a few things that I have learned. Mostly what I've learned is that I don't know a lot. As a matter of fact, the more I live in community and the more I study and the more I pray, the more I realize I don't know. Let me give you an example. I don't know if Adam and Eve had belly buttons. And yes, I have been asked that question seriously over my years. I don't know if Jonah was swallowed by a big fish or a big whale or if he was swallowed by his conscience. I don't know if Mary Magdalene's only problem was that she had seven demons. And I don't know if it was Mary Magdalene, Mary the sister of Martha, or another Mary, or even another woman who anointed Jesus before his burial. But I do know a few things. I know, for instance, that it is very important that we lay a foundation for our children at a very early age, because the truth is, is that a time will come that life will happen to them. Something will occur and their family and their friends alone will not be enough to get them through that experience. I also know that children say profound things and most adults ignore those things. I know that we catch a glimpse of God's kingdom come on earth as we watch our young children playing together and a stranger comes in their midst and they welcome them with open arms and joy not fear and cynicism. I also know that it is the responsibility of the church universal to raise a child in the way that he or she should grow so that when they grow old, they will not depart from it. But how do we get to those things? How do we actually get to work on the stuff that we know I think Jesus tells us in Matthew's gospel what that might look like. In Matthew 7, Jesus tells the story of the wise and the foolish man. Now, many of us learned that song in Sunday school or vacation Bible school. It's a silly song, really, but it is right out of the gospel of Matthew. And Jesus says this to people. A wise man builds his house on the rock so that when the winds come and the rains come, and they do come, that that house will stand on a firm foundation and not fall. And the other man, the foolish man, will build his house on sand so that when the winds and the rain come, that house will tumble down. It will be destroyed. Now, we know something about wind and rain here. We know that wind and rain does come. And we know that it's indiscriminate. We know that it's powerful. We know that wind and rain can not only be destructive, but deadly force. What do we do when the wind and the rain come? How do we decide what is foolish and what is wise? Paul himself says that the cross is foolishness to most people. 
but that in the wisdom of God, God uses the cross as a symbol of power and love and grace. So how is it that we know what is wise and what is foolish? And I would say that certainly we have great teachers who have told us about wise and foolish things, our parents, our grandparents, other relatives, friends, teachers, coaches, the community of faith. But I think experience teaches us mostly about what is wise and what is foolish. Certainly, your mothers or grandmothers or somebody in your family told you don't touch the pot on the stove because it's hot. And how did we learn that there was wisdom in those words? We touched the pot while it was on the stove and we got burnt. So we learn that there's wisdom in some of the things our parents tell us. Certainly we know that we are told regularly to not speak out in anger or when we're upset. And when we finally get there and we have that moment momentary feeling of power and accomplishment, we quickly learn that we have broken a relationship and sometimes those are relationships we cannot repair. We understand that it is wise to go out and serve the needy, the poor, the disenfranchised among us, and many of us go out for the first time to do that and we treat it as if it is a burden. And somehow along the way, our hearts start to grow wider and wider and we begin to see those service opportunities as a way to be Christ to the other to see them as children of God and not merely projects. Paul understood the importance of being wise instead of foolish, of following Christ and doing the things that Christ commanded of the disciples that came after him. He also understood the importance of laying a foundation so that wise choices could be made. He admits in the text that he did not lay Timothy's foundation for faith, but it came from his mother and his grandmother. People had come before him and had already started the process of faith in this young man. Certainly in the community Timothy lived in, there were other people that showed him what it meant to live a life of faith in community. Paul simply comes and lays hands on him mentors him in the faith, helps him to realize his call to ministry, to grow into the person that God has called him to be. And it's a journey that took Timothy to the end of his life. So how do we do that? How do we, as the church, continue to assist and mentor those who are put in our care? How do we do that? I would say that it's probably done not on Sunday morning. Now, I know that might be a shock to some of you, but an hour of Sunday school and an hour of worship is not enough for someone to actually understand what it means to live a life of faith. Certainly studying the scriptures, being in prayer together, being in community on Sunday morning is very important. But I would say the greatest experience, the most powerful witness that we have is what happens in the day-to-day -day mundane living that we do. Going to the store, going to work, sitting at the dinner table, preparing to go on a trip together. This is where Christ becomes known as real, not just words in a book. Our witness is our most powerful tool to nurture the faith of our young people and our youth. So while coming to church on Sunday morning is vital to the faith, there is something more that we should do. John's father died a number of years ago, and after the funeral was over, we gathered at the house, John and his three siblings and the spouses, and while we were there, we, we opened some of the boxes that were in his office closet, and we pulled out this little book, which John and I had the privilege of becoming the owners of. The book is called Youth at Prayer. Inside the book, there's an inscription that it was presented to James Peckham. It was by the women's group 
of Madison Methodist Church when he graduated from high school. This little book is really just a symbol of the church, but it was the only high school memorabilia that my father-in-law had kept. The church witnessed to him what it meant to live a Christian life, the life of a disciple of Jesus Christ. That women's group prayed for those eight graduating students. Yes, I said eight graduating students. But they helped lay the foundation and bear witness that there was more to life than just Sunday morning. That when you left the church after Sunday morning, if you left the community after high school, you could take this with you and know that your church family loved you and cared for you, not just while you were there, but always. It served as a witness, and it was important enough for him to keep. Now, I will say this. My father-in-law was raised in the Madison Methodist Church. He went to Sunday school there and vacation Bible school there, and he did service projects out of that little church. They officiated his funeral and he's buried in the graveyard behind the church today. His children and his children's children all have a glimpse of eternity by what that little women's group did for him as he left the church after high school. I have had the privilege of walking with many students and adults in their faith journeys over my years of ministry And as a matter of fact, one of the first things I did was teach confirmation. Now, I have to say that confirmation was both a blessing and a burden. There are so many lessons that I painstakingly prepared that we never did together. We never taught them. Because what was more important in some of those classes was the conversations that happened as we opened together. There were lots of conversations about decisions that were being made, some really good decisions and some not so good decisions. There were a lot of conversations about life and what it meant to be in middle school and high school, what life was like, what struggles there were. But in all of those things, those youth knew that they were loved and cared for, and certainly not just by me, but by this community of faith that surrounded them. So as the years went by, I got to go on a choir tour, and in the, on the choir tour was senior night on the last night, and there were all those seniors lined up, and they were telling their stories about church and life and where they were going and what they were doing. And it occurred to me on that night that that was my first confirmation class. I had watched them go from confirmands to seniors in high school over the years. It was huge, a huge joy for me. But I recognized something even more important. I had very little to do with it. You see, they had come to understand that the church was their home, that whether their mistakes were good or bad, whether their their life was moving along in perfect order or there was chaos going on, the church was there to love them and care for them. They called the church their home. In the good, in the bad, in the grace and the peace, in the struggle, in the tears, in the joy and the failure, the church embraced them and showed them what it meant to be children of God. And more importantly, the church allowed them to dream big to know that anything that their parents or their grandparents or anybody in the church wanted for them, God had more for them. I keep in touch with some of those youth even today. I know where they are. I know what they're doing. Their lives have not always been easy, but it's been joy to watch them continue to call the church wherever they are home. Now, as much as I would love to take credit for those confirmands and their faith journeys, I can't, like I've said, but there's other journeys that I can't take full credit for either. You see, as a pastor, I would love to tell you that my boys have this great faith, and they are young men now, that they have this great faith because their mom is a pastor and she did this great job and their dad did this great job of raising them in the faith, but we didn't the community that surrounded them, the people 
who loved on them and cared for them, they're the ones that really raised them in the faith and gave them a strong sense of who Jesus is for them today. So let me tell you about Nick's mentor. Nick's mentor in confirmation was named Bob, and Bob is a great guy. He lives close to his family now, so he no longer lives in Texas. Bob is not a really big man. He doesn't command presence in a room, but Bob has the power to move mountains. You see, Bob loves unconditionally, and he loves all people. He loves the disenfranchised and the poor, and he loves those of us who think we have power, even though we should know better. Bob was a master wood turner, and he and Nick would spend hours in his workshop turning bowls, creating these beautiful works of art out of just pieces of wood. Bob was a naturalist and an outdoorsman, and, and he would take Nick kayaking. And he would talk to Nick about the power and glory of God's creation. And they would take pictures and share them with others and talk about how God created these things for us to enjoy. Bob stood for what was right and what was good, and it broke his heart to experience the injustice in the world that he lived in. But lest you believe that Bob was perfect, Bob was human. At one point, I had taken a, a course in addiction ministry, and so before Bob left for Minnesota, where he lives now, he gave me this book. Now, some of you know what this book is just by looking at it. It is the blue book. It's the AA book. Bob was an executive at IBM for many years and realized at some point that he had become an alcoholic. And so Bob checked himself into rehab, and when he got out, instead of returning to IBM, Bob went and got his master's degree in counseling and began counseling other addicts that he knew would need someone to give them a word of hope. So when Bob gave me this book, besides all of the other writing that is in here, he let me know something. He let me know that he was human, that God used his imperfections, what most people would call foolishness, so that God's love might be made manifest in the world, in the lives of those who needed to hear a word of hope. He lived that way every day. This book is so worn, so marked up, and it is my gift, and one that I will cherish for the rest of my life. Bob, in many ways, was my mentor, not just Nick's. But then Nick finally got confirmed. And after confirmation, Bob gave Nick this book. Now, this book is called I Dare You. It was written by William Danforth, and it was published in 1941. 1948. It is socially, politically, and culturally incorrect. It is absolutely written for the 40s. It borders on offensive when you read it the first time through. Except that what you learn about this book is that it actually is a book of very high standards. It talks to men specifically about being people of integrity, high ethics, and excellence. What a concept. So I took this book this week as I read it probably more times than my son Nicholas has read it at this point. And I thought about the dare. I thought about the way William Danforth, who, by the way, was the chairman of the board of Ralston Purina Checkerboard Square. Some of you might remember the full name of that company at the time. And so he wrote a dare to the men of his time, and I would say to those of us in 2015. So I'm going to read you the opening words, and then I took the artistic license and went ahead and rewrote some of the dares in it so that they might be applicable to all of us sitting in here, but most especially to our confirmands this morning. It is difficult to put a challenge on paper. I would rather look you straight in the eye and say, I dare you. 
In my mind, that's exactly what I am doing. I am on one side of a table, you are on the other. I am looking across and saying, I dare you. I dare you to take this life and use it so you might be remembered as one who did what was good and right even when the majority didn't. I dare you to do the uplifting and courageous thing even when those around you are tearing down and living in fear. I dare you to launch into the deep and stop being satisfied with only what your eyes can see. I dare you to fight for justice and peace, to speak truth to power, even if it means you will stand alone. I dare you to ask questions that have no answers. I dare you to live as a disciple of Jesus Christ. May it be so for all of us.